was born in Germany, 1646. His father was a lawyer and professor. His father's personal library was open to him before he was ten. His study of the ancients led him to desire clarity and usefulness in everything he did. He was self-taught, left to himself to learn whatever he wished. In his teenage years, instead of getting drunk all the time, he was reading and studying Descartes on his own. After receiving his baccalaureate from Leipzig, he continued his studies at the University of Altdorf. During this time, he would publish a great dissertation on the art of combinations. Growing up surrounded by law degrees, Leibniz became interested in philosophy and would read the great works of Descartes and Pascal in his free time. Leibniz would later use this knowledge as a jumping off point in his own writings and philosophy. With the help of Jacob Thomasius, Leibniz would write his first philosophical discourse named On the Principle of Individuation. Leibniz basically became a lawyer and soon became an expert of sorts in logic. He worked to introduce philosophy and proper reasoning into the law, which even more then, as it still is somewhat now, was a backwards, provincial, outgroup manipulating, irrational, and illogical farce. Though most knew him for his contributions to calculus, he only even learned advanced mathematical concepts later in life. Leibniz has been given credit for laying the framework of the binary system used in modern computing. Beginning with his dissertation on the art of combinations, and updating the system throughout his career, he perfected the system of mathematics. He would do binary calculations for years with no objective in mind other than obtaining a more robust understanding of the method of calculation. It was through this trial and error that he developed better and better methods of binary calculation. With his complete understanding of this binary system, Leibniz invented a rudimentary computer using marbles and punch cards. Later, these marbles would be replaced with electrical currents and the punch cards with hard drives. Leibniz was quoted as saying, it is unworthy of an excellent man to lose hours like slaves in the labor of calculation, which could be safely relegated to anyone else if machines were used. And it was this thought that led Leibniz to invent a calculating machine that would be able to handle square roots as well as fractions, all with a purely mechanical structure that he would call the Stepped Reckoner. This calculator would bring Leibniz into the Royal Society, which gave him the opportunity to collaborate with other inventors and introduce his new ideas. Because Leibniz found ways to use his binary system, he began to believe that without application, theories were useless, and would urge that theory be combined with practical application. Because of this, many have attributed Leibniz as the father of applied science. Leibniz wrote an essay to the president of the Royal Society, and the prince was so impressed, he made Leibniz secretary. Part of Leibniz's job was keeping track of everyone's experiments, so he ended up learning chemistry. Now Leibniz started hanging with rich and powerful people, and this got him work with Baron von Boinenberg. Leibniz and his political allies thought that Louis XIV was going to make a move to become dictator of Europe, and they wanted to stop him before he got the chance. They wanted to find an outlet for his energies. In effect, Leibniz went to Paris as a spy to try to convince Louis XIV to attack Egypt and the Turks instead of other Europeans. While in Paris, he met many great mathematicians, including Christian Huygens. Huygens personally tutored him in physics and mathematics. 
After accessing Pascal's and Descartes' unpublished mathematical manuscripts, Leibniz found interest in developing his work on differential calculus and infinite series. Leibniz's political mission went nowhere. But that didn't matter, because being in Paris gave him the chance to meet the most famous scientists of his time which turned out to be a much more important happenstance. Christian Huygens was one of the greatest physicists in the world. When Leibniz first met him in Paris, Huygens was just publishing his work on the pendulum. Leibniz was probably acquainted with Cavalieri's book, then he had heard of Wallace. He had become used to looking at finite quantities as being made up of an infinite number of infinitely small parts. By 1675, Leibniz had achieved his algorithm of the differential and integral calculus. He had found not just results, but fundamental principles, including the notation and techniques everyone still uses today. Although the idea that Leibniz took inspiration from Isaac Newton while forming and perfecting his own version of calculus is hotly debated, it does beg the question, what came to Leibniz first, Newton's letters or the integral of an egg? Everyone has their favorite opinion on who created calculus because human beings love to pick sides, love to think they're right and generally enjoy giving credit to one person for discoveries, especially when many more than just one person deserve it. Both Newton and Leibniz would fight to the grave over the rights to calculus, but neither would win. What cannot be contested, however, is the new methods and inventions both men brought to the table. Leibniz was given credit for discovering the method separation of variables, the separation of variables is a method of solving first-order linear equations and partial differential equations, in which algebra is involved to rewrite an equation so that each of the two variables appear on a different side of the equation. Leibniz also contributed to the reduction of homogeneous equations. Leibniz was a polymath, and his intellectual interests and achievements involved metaphysics, law, economics, politics, logics, and mathematics. According to Leibniz's notebooks, a critical breakthrough occurred on November 11, 1675, when he employed integral calculus for the first time to find the area under the graph of a function y equals f of x. He introduced several notations used to this day, for instance, the integral sign, representing an elongated s from the Latin word summa, and the D used for differentials, from the Latin word differentia. Leibniz exploited infinitesimals in developing calculus and argued that the integral was a sum of an infinite number of rentals. He was involved in the development of the multinomial theorem, which describes how to expand a power of a sum in terms of powers of the terms in that sum. This theorem is the generalization of the binomial theorem to polynomials. Leibniz used the principle of the law of continuity to specify arithmetic operations, from ordinary numbers to infinitesimals, which allowed Leibniz's introduction to infinitesimal calculus. He devised a new theorem of motion, based on kinetic energy and potential energy, which posited space as relative, whereas Newton was thoroughly convinced that space was absolute. An important example of Leibniz's mature physical thinking is in his specimen, Dynamicum of 1695. Leibniz's speculative ideas about aspects of nature, not reducible to statics and dynamics, made little sense. For instance, he anticipated Albert Einstein by arguing against Newton, that space, time, and motion are relative and not absolute. 
he also contributed to the importance of the product of mass times velocity, also called vis viva. He realized that the total energy of an object would be conserved in certain mechanical systems. Hence, Leibniz assumed the total energy as an innate motive characteristic of matter. His vis viva was seen as rivaling the conservation of momentum, popularized by Newton in England and by Descartes in France, both neglecting Leibniz's idea of energy conservation. However, the two approaches are equally valid because both energy and momentum are conserved. Leibniz is one of the first scientists who argues the existence of a fundamental theorem. Importantly, Leibniz contributed to an early statement with regard to the law of conservation of energy. Leibniz was obsessed with removing ambiguity in words and concepts. Yet he still believed in and sought to provide the intellectual justification for God, probably the most ambiguous word and concept there is. The split between Catholicism and Protestantism greatly troubled Leibniz as the wars between them had negatively affected Germany. He spent much of his life trying to reunite Christianity in vain. His philosophy of optimism was famously ridiculed by Voltaire. Well, my dear Pangloss, said Candide to him, when you had been hanged, dissected, whipped, and were tugging at the oar, did you always think that everything happens for the best? I am still of my first opinion, answered Pangloss, for I am a philosopher and I cannot retract, especially as Leibniz could never be wrong. And besides, the pre-established harmony is the finest thing in the world. Voltaire was a proponent of Newton, but it wasn't just bias. Leibniz's philosophy of optimism was potentially dangerous for science and open and free societies. And his promotion of religious ideas were suspect due to his connections to political authorities. Who would have used Leibniz's writings on God to prop up their own power? famous correspondence with Clark, who was effectively Newton's go-between in an extensive argument between the two prolific men. He died soon after. So, what'd you think about this documentary? I didn't think it was very good at all. I didn't like the part about Leibniz. It was boring, and I don't like math. They didn't even talk about the most integral part. <laughs> <laughs>